In the first Studio Inter of 2022, we'll be discussing all things Inter with Serie A commentator Owen Nielsen. We'll be discussing Stefano Sensi's should he stay or should he go, should he be kept until the summer. We'll be reviewing the Venezia game, this week's Moji, Moratti and Frog, and much, much more. Everything you want Studio Inter on the Inter.com. Still done crossing in. Eddie Dzeko. The champion spirit save for the last minute of the game and Inter take the lead. Benvenuti, bentornati to the first Studio Inter of 2022. It's been quite a little break since the last one. Uh, that is all entirely on me. It's been incredibly busy. Uh, there's also been a little bit of health issues I've had. The Om- I've done the Omicron dance, um, not as fun as it sounds, but we're, we're back now. I'm healthy, every- everyone's good, um, and we're going to get back to doing these weekly podcasts. And joining me is Semprinter.com preview writer, Mr. Mohamed Nasa. Welcome, Mo. Hello, hello. Happy to be back. Yeah, good to have everyone back again. And we're also joined by Semprinter.com feature writer. He writes a column called what, Five Things We Learned From Inter This Week, Mr. Jake Smalley. Good evening. Um, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to everybody. Yeah, happy Easter, you know, get get all that out. <laughs> happy birthday, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and we're also joined by a good friend of the show. He has a YouTube channel on uh, on YouTube, which is a good place to have a YouTube channel on. His name is called the Uncle Sharma Channel. Welcome back, Raul Sharma. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy 2022. And yeah, checking in one of the last few remaining members of Korea FC. <laughs> yeah, we will, we will discuss that. Don't you worry about that. Um, and we're also joined by a very good friend of mine. Um, he's a Serie A commentator and he's been doing it for almost a decade, if I'm not wrong. It's the But it's the first time he's on Studio Inter. Welcome, Mr. Owen Nielsen. Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. <laughs> it's well, more than a decade, Nima. It's more yeah, than a decade. It, 2010. It yeah, you're right. That's the first time I was down there, and that's when we met. Yeah, I remember now. You're absolutely right. It's been it's for over a decade. Um, well, I'm glad that we finally got it together and we were able to come on our pod because I've asked you lots of times and it's not never really worked out. But the reason I wanted to have you on now is because you've been doing quite a few, it's quite a string of Inter games, and I'm keen to hear what your thoughts are because Inter won the Scudetto, obviously, as we all know. They choked on the celebrations because Antonio Conte quickly resigned um, or left by mutual consent, I guess, is, is according to the press release. Uh, Hakimi sold, Lukaku sold, replaced by, uh, obviously, Christian Eriksen's medical uh, uh, emergency and repla- they were quickly replaced by Dumfries, Dzeko and Chalanoglu. Um, and everyone was saying, well, you know, this is a, you know, this is a low budget Inter. Can Simone Inzaghi do it? You know, and most people who follow me on social media, I've been a big fan of, of Simone Inzaghi since 2017. I think he's a fantastic coach. And I think, you know, I thought, I've always thought he's the next Italian super coach, but after Conte and Allegri. But I even I'm surprised by how quickly he's taken on this Inter to play this kind of football at this level and to be, well, to pretty much hitting every single objective through from the, through from the group stage of the Champions League, won the Supercoppa, could en route to you know the top of the league can defend the Serie A title. They could even, they could even make a domestic treble. I mean, did you expect this these results? And if not, I mean, how, how surprised are you at if at all by Simone Inzaghi's uh, fortune so far at Inter? I think it would have been difficult to imagine the run that they've been at the moment, the head to head record that they've had. Lukaku obviously and Hakimi two huge players and then of course contact going those are big changes and Simone Zaghi did a fantastic job at Lazio no doubt about that but um it's a bigger challenge obviously coming to to the Miata playing uh, you know one of the biggest football stages possible uh, Apiano Gentile and just how quickly he's been able to get a lot of the talk here at least you know in the media and you know the, the wise sages of Italian football um, is that it, he's built on Conte's Inter, which I think at the beginning, obviously, you know, the winning mentality. But of course, it's taken on a new form now. That last season they were they were the, they were chasing, and this year they're the chased. 
And and we've seen that in the recent matches, as you said, I've done um I think five of the last games from Torino. I did last I did the last four league games and then the Super Cup final. And you know, they they're put under pressure in the sense of playing longer, you know, 120 minute matches, the game with Empoli, which I didn't do, Patrick Kendrick did similar situation. So there's a, there's a greater pressure instead of chasing it's a classic situation. You know, what, what, um, the King is dead long live the King. And Inzaghi has managed to you know, create this spirit within the game you know, seeing Sanchez score in the super cup final in the last second coming on as a substitute. Um, even Dzeko scoring, you know, Dumfries had come on as a substitute in the last game against Venezia, where they didn't play particularly well. It was like it was another uh, milan Spezia situation, this, uh, the, the spell of San Siro for some reason. But um, yeah, they, they get the victories even when they're not playing well. And it's it's impressive. Um, everybody thought with Allegri coming back to Juventus that they were going to be the main challenges, but that obviously hasn't paid out, the lack of quality in the midfield and um, clearly picking up the the difference with Ronaldo's goals not being there. Well, Inter just managed to play attractive football, by far the best midfield. And um, up until recently, the best defence, got a few worries at the moment with these... You know, the high balls coming in, if you want to get into specifics. But yeah, overall, as your question, I think um, it has been a surprise how quickly he's managed to get in there. I mean, he's got a great... Great energy, but we saw that with with uh, with Lazio. Do you remember when Caicedo equalised at the um, Allianz Stadium for Lazio, mm. and he went running down the line and jumped on <laughs> top of uh, Caicedo with all the rest of the players? So it's you know, similar sort of behaviour that we've seen before. But I like his style. You know, different type of person to Conte, obviously, but um, an emerging coach. Yeah, he's won the the Super Cup and the, and the Coppa Italia before, but winning the league is a completely different thing. And you see that there's that extra energy, that extra um, determination on his part in terms of managing the players when you listen to his press match, uh, post-press match conferences, pre-conferences, um, he's got that steel that I think from an Inter perspective is, um, is a positive. Yeah, I mean, personally, I I love Spalletti, and I and I think tactically Antonio Conte is a genius. But it's it is a nice change after two crazy people to have someone who is sane, and and Simone Inzaghi is sane, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's 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 a nice change um, to to have someone who speaks in complete sentences, isn't a mouth breather, and 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 doesn't have emotional breakdowns. But well, um, Spalletti, Spalletti is interesting, though, isn't he? He's like something out of a uh, um, a Renaissance. <laughs> epic poem the way that he goes about <laughs> for me it's it's he's like he's like a character out of a david lynch movie like okay. it's just it's, it's just he's he's so and he knows absurd it. and, he knows, it. and he knows it exactly he's like it's just i love him i i absolutely love what he did tremendous at skin for a man his age I <laughs> yeah and i mean i mean just the fact that he he i mean just the stuff like he wears you know he's incredibly well dressed and he used to bike around milan in a suit which I think is an incredibly awesome quality that so that's that he did. Um, anyway, I'm going to hand you over to uh, to Mo. Did you have a question for Owen? Yeah. So uh, hi, Owen. Uh, continuing on uh, the Inzaghi vein, um, I wanted to ask you. So I'm going to give you three options, and maybe uh, maybe you, you can think of something else. But uh, beyond the transformation, the transformative uh, nature of the style of play, more expansive, more free-flowing, so on and so forth, that Inzaghi has uh, implemented on Inter. If I were to give you three uh, micro options of where I see his impact having, you know, made the difference, uh, maybe you can tell me which one you think is more impressive or something else completely. I reckon for me, looking out, looking at the club and then over, over half a season now, the things that surprise me are Bastoni is, uh, you know, his new found position. Uh, we know under Conte, he, he was uh, pushed up front more and more, but now his contributing play up uh, right at the 18-yard box is very impressive. Um, and the number of assists he's done so far this season from within the opponent's box, not like last season, that lovely assist to Barella. Um, then there's the fact that we've seen Hakan Charanoglu you know, t- knock on wood and everything, uh, has been consistent and performing quite well for over half a season now. I don't think 
any Milanista has uh, has uh, witnessed uh, the Turkish playmaker on such decent form uh, for such a long stretch of time. And the third would be the management of uh, Dumfries' transition, um, particularly after you know all the expectation that uh, was put on the poor young man's the shoulders. Uh, having uh, re- been required to fill in for uh, Hakimi and then a couple of, uh, you know, less than stellar uh, uh, starts uh, at the beginning of the season. And now we find that uh, Dumfries is, you know, uh, uh, probably one of the, the brightest shining um, uh, stars or prospects in the side. Uh, do, you, do you think you give Inzaghi particular praise on any of those three, or do you think it's just an actual progression on the side, or do you have something else in mind uh, uh, for Inzaghi? Well, I, all of you guys obviously very, very close to Inter, and um, that's very, very, three very precise choices um, in different areas. Uh, I think you know, the mentality of or, or the personality of Inzaghi is something very important, just like it is with Conte, just as Nima said, as you all know, is that the different type of personality. I mean, Bastoni is the prototype of the new Italian defender, it seems, this season. He's been you know, compared to you know, a Gazzetta piece I read last week or the week before that interplay with 12 players now because of the, the um, flexibility of Bastoni's role and how he can essentially, I think, you know, the... Um, what do you call it, Baricentro, the, the average position in the touching the ball was higher than that of Perisic in the, in the game when they played Lazio and he got the goal and got the assist. Um, of course, he doesn't do that every game at goal and assist, but every game you see him being so mobile. Chalanolu, yeah, I don't think anybody, and it goes back to Nima's first question, I don't think anybody expected him to slot in, you know, score in the derby, score, but he scored on the first in the game against Bologna, was it, or the first game of the season from outside the area? Um, to slot in so well. Seems like a more delicate character. Chalanolu wants to be loved, wants to feel that he's loved, wants to be able to express himself um, as best he can and maybe he feels he can do that or he has been doing that better with Inter than he did with Milan. And then Dumfries, absolutely the pressure of Hakimi. I think the goal for him was at Roma, his first goal, the diving header, which was a beautiful goal. And since then, you know, the goal he scored, the winner against, uh, against Torino as well. Again, I mentioned before the assist. Uh, he scored as well against Venezia, no? and um, the assist just on the weekend against uh, against Venezia in the last minute. So, Mohamed, to not skirt around your question, I would say that, yeah, those three are standout examples, definitely in terms of the contribution. But in terms of Inzaghi's... Um, yeah, I mean, you've got to say he's picked up where Conte left off, but he still had to reinterpret it himself and still has to go out, you know, go out every day to Apiano and do do his job. And it seems that he's been able to bring together. I mean, in those three examples, those are three specific sort of characters. They're um, they're not like Barella, for example. Barella, you know, rock hard, sardo, uh, Sardinian um, head, but apparently a fantastic person. Whereas th- those are the three, Bastoni, I don't know, he's a bit more, he's younger as well, he just had a baby. Um, Dumfries really relies on De Vrij because he doesn't speak Italian yet. And Chalanolu switching didn't seem to phase him at all where other players it would have done. But you'd need the right environment around you to be able to um, start so quickly. And as you said, no, um, keep the consistency. Other players than that, I mean, Lautaro Martinez is Lautaro Martinez quality of every time. Perisic. Perisic, I mean, we went to San Siro, me and uh, Marco Palmieri, to watch a game just as fans. And we watched Perisic play in that game with Shakhtar, I think it was, when Dzeko scored twice. And Perisic was an absolute beast. I remember when he went to Bayern Munich and it seemed like that was the end of it. And then he came back and even the, this season, there have been rumours that he, he was playing really well so that he can get a transfer back to Germany. As I'm sure all of you have read. Um, but he's so consistent and um, he's been very impressive as well. Um, yeah, I mean, we could talk about every single player, really. For sure. Um, I'm going to enjoy over to Jake. Did you have a question for Owen? Then the floor is yours. Yeah, I'm just interested uh, to hear what you think about the title race for this season. Uh, I think at the moment you're probably going to say that Inter definitely the driving seat. Um, but who do you think will be the biggest challenger uh, that could stop Inter from retaining the title? 
Yeah, there was because today was the beginning of the Sosta, the international break. There was a lot of sort of um, end of a chapter talk on the on the Italian radio and on on Sky last night with the Sky Sky Culture and um, Zio Bergomi mm. was on last night, and he said, yeah, in my opinion, doesn't come close to his, but he said as far as the league is going, it only takes two defeats and things can change. Um, but when you look at the squads available, okay, Angisa, Kulabali, Unas coming back. Ossiman, Ossiman. Ossiman, Ossiman coming back, absolutely. Mm. You'd say, Na- I would say Napoli more. Yeah, we saw that last night. The derby is going to be fundamental, it seems. First game in hand against Bologna. There's a long way to go. There's still a lot of points still to play for. Um, but second to Inter, uh, We've had so many more options coming off the bench, and we've seen what the bench has done in the last uh, five or six matches for Inter. Milan purely definitely deserves some sort of medal for what he's managed to create at Milan Melo with the, you know, the better than the sum of its uh, some of its parts. But I don't know, Napoli. Do they? Be, it's it's the winning mentality. That's always the thing you you think about and. Napoli, Spalletti's never won the league. Zoli's never won the league. Mori, uh, Inzaghi's never won the league, but a lot of the players have. Um, Juventus doesn't look like it. I mean, last night, a lot of Juventus fans complaining today about the way that Juve played without heart last night. I was listening to some callers on the radio this morning. Um, so it's going to come down to the head to heads. You know, that's why Roma are never going to be involved because they've lost too many of the head-to-heads. And for whatever reason, as Mourinho said, after they lost that game against Juventus, that they've got some, some mental blocks and inability to get over these big games. That's why they keep losing them. Inter don't seem to have that. Milan, a mm, bit of a jolly in the Italian sense, a joker. But um, if, if, Mil- if, if, it's going to be a lot of ifs there. Uh, if, uh, if Milan win the derby, which I would say they start second favourites, uh, sure, it can happen for sure because you know, Inter have got the Champions League, and um, and there's always pressure. There's always pressure. We saw against Venezia the other night; they, they didn't play that well against Venezia. Um, Chalonolu didn't really sparkle like he usually did. You know, Barella was just the one driving it. For Brozovic didn't have his best game, but eventually they had the quality and um, a lot of controversy about the first goal with Jeko and the elbow. But uh, yeah. I mean, as the league table says, it's going to be. It looks like it's going to be either Milan or Napoli. Atalanta probably the best squad out of the, the ones chasing. Mm. Probably the best team. Probably the best football um, out of the teams chasing. Um, if they put on a spurt, which they can do, five six wins in a row, but it's going to come down to those head to heads. So they've already played into twice, um, two draws. So into a big advantage has to be. I mean, what do you guys think? I I think Napoli. I think for me, I I feel the wind has gone out of Milan's sails uh, sails a little bit um, over the past month. Uh, when you look at the the injuries that they have, and how they have a striker issue. I mean, they sent Pellegrini out on you know that that loan has been terminated. He's gone to Torino from Monaco. Well, Ibrahim, they waste the time. That yeah, was compl- a, yeah. I mean that that was Asian just silly. Thing. Yeah, well, probably. Yeah, I mean, it's and, and Ibrahimovic is. His is is it's there's nothing wrong with his quality. The issue is his body. It just he just can't compete at that level anymore. Even though he 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 he's forcing himself. There was Olivier... a great thing today, Nima and guys. You remember um, Ciccio Graziani who played uh, along with um, Paolo yeah. Pulici at Torino in the seventies, and they were yeah. they, he's a constant guest on Radio Sportiva and all this whole conversation about the the pitch at San Siro. Yeah, and he just. Just said when we used to play at San Siro in December, January, February, the middle of the pitch used to be ice, and we just got on with it and we just did it. No one ever complained. <laughs> now, everybody's now everybody's complaining. As far as I'm concerned, it's a lack of technical quality more than Ooh. the fact that the pitch was bad. It was deemed that the pitch was good enough to play on, they played on it, and then now everyone's complaining, which is a different perspective to what the media and Maldini said, for example, after last night's game. Yeah. But I mean, I I understand when these old timers say stuff like that, and to a certain extent, they're right. But at the same time, 
in the 80s, Hellas Verona won the Scudetto with a chain-smoking Dane as one of the key players. I mean, it's it's a different level today. And and I and I understand that it can get a little bit too ridiculous in terms of, you know, they these players are so pampered. But the way that the, the level where they train, how they eat, all every the science around it is a completely different thing. And I do think that when you play on that potato farm that they played on, that does hurt the players. Yeah, but that's the leg, you know, that's the leg anemia. You know this. Yeah. I think that's the first time maybe in history, that Inter and Milan have both played at San Siro on the same weekend. And that's just become of this come from this randomized yeah. like, half of the season that they've done <laughs> for the first time ever as well. So, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's it's a complicated one. Yeah, it is. I'm going to hand you over to Rahul for a question as well. Did you have a question for Owen? Yeah, hi Owen, a big fan of your voice and your commentary. Um, just wanted to ask more in general Serie A question, actually. Who has been your surprise player of the season until now? Uh, Pobega, I would probably say. He's been my favourite. Um, mm. Which is a good sign for Milan, because he's still on lo- I love the story. You know, it's, when you're commentating, it's all about the story. You know? It's all about the narrative, as well as the statistics and so on. It's about the emotion, it's about the joy, the tragedy, the... And the... The progress that he's made, I think it was what Pordenone, Carnana, Spezia, and now last year with Spezia and Serie A, and then now with Torino. Um, I like the story, I think he plays very well. Having that left foot, I mean, there's so many good players, obviously, you come take all these players, there's lots of good ones. Daniele Verde, I always like my mm. love of Serie B. We started doing Serie B again, so it sort of reignited my Serie B fire after a few years where we weren't doing the comp. Uh, Verde just signed a new contract. Um, who else? Who else? Well, I choose those two. They're the first two. That I don't know. I love those ones that sort of, you know, earn the stripes, you know, they fight their way through and they go and probably Pobega will play for the national team in three maybe three years two three years mm-hmm. and um, he looks uh, very similar to Milan or long lost brother of Milan Skriniar <laughs> <laughs> well I mean you got uh, this is something I would be interested to ask you guys what is going on with De Vrij and Skriniar at the moment obviously De Vrij with the goal that Immobile scored at yeah. San Siro I don't know where he just pulled the plug on his brain <laughs> he was criticised for the goal by McKenney in the Copa in the Super Cup final, and then Skriniar losing Henri was a strangely as well because he was the, you know it was good movement from Henri, but at the same time it wasn't a late run into the box. He could see him the whole time, so that's one area. I mean, what, what do you guys think is going on there with those crosses in? Both all those goals were from the right or from the left. I think it's a, a number of issues. One main one being that. They don't trust Handanovic. They don't trust him. And they have every right not to trust him um, because of the incredible howlers that he makes. Um, oh, he should have, he should have saved that. He should have saved yeah. on his uh, Yeah. Head no, I mean, it, and, and also when he came out against, I can't remember before um, if it was uh, which game it was when he came out and caused a goal when, when, when he read the situation on again. The, the, the problem is that they don't trust each other. Handanovic doesn't seem to trust them and they don't seem to trust him, which creates them, which creates this kind of, they, 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 they don't, it's not like when it was a few years ago when both of them, when they all kind of knew each other, knew what the other one was going to do and they trusted each other and so... Um, we did get what was it six or seven clean sheets in a row. In the yeah, league. but I mean, look at the ge- look at the op- opposition in those games. I mean, let's let's be honest; it wasn't exactly they were playing the top sides. In- what about what about another thing? I'd be interested from your opinion <clears throat> about them. How you remember back in the day? Back in the day, you know, let's say like when Chievo in Serie A, which wasn't that long ago, mm. you would never see the game um, Venezia. Was it Venezia? Or was it wrong? Oh, yeah, but it's, sorry, a lot of games. And then at the end, they put on Sigurdsson and who was the other forward they put on? And essentially, they put on two forwards um, in the last 10 minutes yeah. to try and win the game against Inter when it was still 1 1. And Spezia obviously beating Milan, which was incredible. Um, Empoli beating Napoli. Don't you think Serie A this season has. Yeah, it's been different in this. You know, like you said before, there. Look at the opposition. 
But this year, yeah. we've seen more shocks. We've seen more, you know, someone compared it, I don't know where I was listening to it, about it's a little bit more like, oh, it was Paolo Di Canio last night, I think. He said a little mm. bit more like the Premier League. Obviously, he meant it, you know, in inverted commas. Not like Premier League. But, um, <laughs> oh, all he does is make these Premier League oh, yeah, yeah. English references, doesn't he? He, dro- in he, that drives show. Care- he drives Caressa crazy. Yeah, he really does. I don't know does. if it's all part of the show, but it's like Caressa's like always <laughs> looking at one eyebrow up, like what? Yeah, he does. It really annoys him with all the English, with all the English references in that but, show. But like you said, like Cable, <laughs> Cable used to go to San Siro. Mm. I, I did the games, and they would, you know, they wouldn't do anything. Or Genoa, they wouldn't do. Oh, Genoa still don't do a lot, but. Um, <laughs> You know, these other teams, they are producing shocks. As I said, Empoli, Spezia, Venezia, you know, beating Roma at home, stuff like that. And that, that makes Serie A much more, so, more, so much more interesting, both here in Italy and, uh, mm. and abroad. Don't you, don't you all agree? Oh, I mean, sure. I mean, I, I think it's got to do with the fact that the top teams in, in Italy can't invest. Um, they don't have the money to invest, and therefore, you know, the, the, the gap becomes a little bit less by by every transfer window when the when the strong teams can't invest and in fact in inter's in inter's case they you could actually even though inter are doing better on paper in result wise and scoring more goals yeah. no one in their right mind would say that hakan chalanoglu was a better player than christian eriksen uh no one would say that edin Dzeko at 35 is better than romelu lukaku or that denzel dumfries is better than ashraf hakimi um, but well, that opens up a huge conversation, isn't it? Uh, going against <laughs> Liverpool. Yeah, um, exactly. it's, it's it's interesting to say that, isn't it? Obviously, Nima, you know, or you guys, Nima, you know for sure that I've been here through the dark days of uh, yes, yes, that's of what Milan football, know. where you know there was no Champions League in the city, and considering when I arrived here in 2010 as a city, it had more Champions League than it did. It had ten, than Madrid nine. Um, and obviously that consistent appearance in the Champions League and the financial benefits for whichever teams are in it, not just the, the super clubs. Um, and those that aren't, such as Inter weren't, and such as Milan uh, mm. haven't been, weren't. Um, it does make a difference, doesn't it? And so maybe the expectations need to be a little, you know, just modified a little bit. It's like, OK, wait a minute, how many seasons have you played consecutively in the Champions League? Three, mm. okay. How many seasons of Bayern Munich or Real Madrid or Barcelona or PSG or you know go down the list? Yeah. And then all the other, you know, obviously with the shakes and so on and so on. So it's an interesting, I mean, from your perspective, do you try to because it's difficult, no, because we're so we love football. So we were like, oh, but we want to win, we want to win. And if you don't win, it's like, oh, it's so bad. <laughs> but then you've got to look at what's behind it, what you know, how they I mean, got- I what I'm looking at, what I'm worried about. I mean, for me, the most important thing is that Beppe Marotta extended his contract. Um, even though they haven't officialized it. But the fact that he goes out and says, we already have an agreement in place, the club will make it. We don't have agents, you know, we we, we sit and talk and we've just, we've all, you know, it, it's up to the club to make it official whenever they do. That to me is, 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 is very important because it provides stability um, yeah. going forward for a few years. And I think that's the most important thing. But I mean, well, I've seen Juventus' transfer policy exactly. since Marotta left. Yeah, it's been a disaster. I mean, poor Arriva Bene has arrived and he's cleaning up an absolute mess after Paratici, who completely destroyed the Juventus from the inside out. Well, I mean, Paratici if, if, getting in Conte at Tottenham seems to be a good move. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an interesting one. And Conte looks angrier than I've ever seen him. So I'm so kind of wait, <laughs> I'm angry waiting. Angry or false smile? No, the thing is, I'm I'm really looking forward to when Antonio Conte gets Spurs on the final match day into the top four. And once that's done, and everyone is like, "Oh, congratulations, Antonio! How 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 do you feel?" And he goes the classic Antonio nuclear meltdown, where he just okay, strips, I mean, but you know, you you strips you, Levi Levy of all honor <laughs> on live TV the way that he does does when when he's unhappy. Okay, and but do, do, you over. know historical perspectives? Or to me, is always interesting. So if you went back all the way back to you know Eleni Arera, you yeah. went back. Mancini, more recent mm. times, Mourinho, he went to, you know, any of the Papatoni. Yeah. Um, where does Conte sit in the in the all time roster? Obviously, only won one Scudetto, but he's still, you know, no, for me, for a me, decade it's, of not winning a Scudetto. So, for know. me, for me, it's easy. Me and Mo, we've spoken about it, about this, and and for us, it's he's he's on there with the Trapatoni at the Trapatoni level. I mean, he doesn't go clear near. Because of the way that they won, I mean, this 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 that team had so many similarities to Inter de Record, 
um, and the way that they, you know, both a Juve icon coach coming in, the way that they just, they struggled a little bit in the beginning and then went off on these runs and just demolished everyone. The fact that they might have peaked a little bit too soon, there, there was no, you know, there was no ciclo, there was no cycle. Uh, under him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But with Trapattoni was a different thing because he won a cu- UEFA Cup as well and 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 stuff like that. But no, uh, for me, it's somewhere there. Uh, and what about that that very firm line he put in the stand about the you know the Pate uh, in Damala? He was just like, no, Pate, uh, that's ended now. We 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 win. Yeah, but it's not true because he he saw he, he was the first. I mean, what what game was it, Rahul, where we saw him where he was cringing on the sidelines when. When when Inter were two nil, was it a Parma away? When it's like Antonio, you 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 know he's he's under he was kind of his body language was just screaming that like, you can't get the Pazza out of this club. Which game was that? I can't remember. You know which <laughs> yeah, one it I might mean, have right? been Parma or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, one, first, the one where he was in the uh, room agony. with his brother and he was going yeah in crazy. agony. Crazy. Yeah, he was in agony. He was in physical pain because Inter were were so Pazza that it just goes against everything that he stands for. He's he's used to a Juve where you know everything is organized and normal, and he walks into this vortex known as the Inter and and he's he's just not you know. It, 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 but for you as Interisti, is this is the, is it really a litmus test against Liverpool, or do you take it as I oh, know it didn't really uh, the original draw for the Champions League was far more painful. <laughs> but um, oh, can't even make league. that. Can't even make that. I don't even know how to react to that nonsense. Another aspect of uh, you know European football that is interesting, and um, you know, is it is it that if we lose against Liverpool, we understand the benchmark? I mean, I I suppose most Interisti would understand. Would feel they're going in as, as yeah, underdogs. Maybe not massive underdogs, but underdogs to some extent. Um, going back to what you said before, um, Nima about investment and Spezia and Empoli and and mm. Benetia being able to to produce some shocks. Is it a case that you, as Interisti, you're still looking and saying that okay, we need, you know, maybe another two to three seasons to realistically fight for the semi final final. Maybe four seasons. I don't know. What about what do you think, Mo? Uh, I'm keen to hear what you think on that. You don't want to know what I think. <laughs> <laughs> we actually, I do. I really do. I I think uh, I I think um, Inter have. I think if Inter managed to squeak past Liverpool, then um, all bets are off, and. I also think that Inter have a very decent chance of making it past Liverpool at the moment. At the moment, um, especially seeing what's going on with the Afcon contingent uh, for for Liverpool, um, I don't think I I don't think um, uh, anything can be take you know anything negative any negative result barring maybe like a, a, a five nil thrashing at uh, at the Meazza would be held too much against uh, Inzaghi and the project. But I really do think that this team, uh, what we've seen so far, it, like you said earlier, Owen, uh, this is a continuation of what Conte has built. So this team, the, the backbone of this team has already reached a European final. It has won uh, uh, a top tier trophy, not a, not a Supercoppa, not a Coppa Italia. It has won the Scudetto and now is in the last 16 of the Champions League. So I think a lot of people, particularly in Teristi, are all, always wary of being a bit too optimistic. But I really do think that this team is far more developed mentally and as a cohesive unit than we give them credit for. So I really, I, I'm, I'm very cautiously and guardedly optimistic, but definitely optimistic nonetheless. So I think, uh, yeah, that's where I stand. I mean, that is one of the fascinating aspects, isn't it, of, the, of being the, the, the hunter to the hunted. Both um, in Italy and, and and to an extent in in Europe, not the same obviously because they didn't win the Champions League, but there's still that raise in expectation. And obviously, op- oppositions look at you in a different way. Oh, this is these are the Italian champions as opposed to you know, they're they're chasing for the for the title, and um, also the Super Cup champions. And um, that expectation works both ways, doesn't it? Because it's like you say, you get the the confidence from having done it before, but then you get the pressure for the, the expectation to do it again. And um, we saw in the game at Atalanta, I think this, I mean, do you all feel that this is a good time for the international break for Inter? Everyone can just take a few days, you know, a week off or, well, obviously it's the international, so we're not going to get a time off, but 
just for the club, you know, disband that piano for a bit and. Well, given that Simon Inzaghi Because they did, they they played a lot of football just in January, and um, maybe. Well, maybe I mean, given given that for... given that Simon Inzaghi tested positive for COVID, I I think absolutely that's a you know that that's a good thing that, that there is a break because I think it's imperative that he's part of um, of the daily workings at Apiano surrounding the team, you know, the the the, the preparations and all that. So I think. And the fact that he tested positive today gives me a slight hope that maybe the others, the other players, because, I mean, it's not for European players. I mean, it's essentially just a training camp. The Italian players, 35 players been called up to 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 by Mancini for pretty much a training session for over the weekend. Uh, it's more the African and South American and Asian qualifiers that actually that they're the ones that are playing real like competitive football. And there the apprehension is, of course, I mean, Correa's injured. So it's Lautaro, Vidal and Sanchez. Those are the ones that were Inter are worried about. And given Alexis Sanchez history, you know, with, with traveling to South America and getting injured, um, there, there is apprehension. Great celebration there. from him after the goal, though, wasn't it? And he was like, yeah. shouting for Chile, <laughs> saying hello to his mom. I love you, mom. <laughs> and, uh, and then the interview afterwards, I'm like a caged lion. Um, yeah. Great scenes. Yeah, sure was. Um, before we let you go, Owen, um, just quickly, um, what? who do you think will end up winning the Scudetto? Uh, you know, I mean, if we just go by the numbers and the um, and the form, it seems difficult to make any other argument than Inter at the moment. But mm. obviously things change. It's just sport. And it's, not, um, it's not pre-written. You know, the media here... With, with that game in hand, pretty much have um, into as clear favourites. But you know, they lose if they lose the derby, the situation can dramatically change. Confidence mm. is often fragile in certain. Yeah. You know, when it's really tested, the pressure test comes on. So, but if Inter keep playing as they've been playing, you know, all the wins in a row. Okay, they drew against Atalanta, which is still a credible point in the sense that Atalanta could easily have won that game. Inter could have won the game as well. Echo with those two headers. Mm. Um, also, that shot from Sanchez, what a save by Musa. Um, but just look at the league, t- look at the league table, look at the games to come. Their direct rival at the moment is Milan. If, if Inter beat Milan in the derby, massive game. So sad that San Siro isn't full. Mm. And um, and when they're game in hand, then they're going to be what? Seven, eight, seven, ten seven, points seven, yet. Seven, eight ten points, points ahead, but yeah. you know, going through that's a good cushion. So you, you yeah. know, you want to be eight ahead than be eight behind. Yeah, for sure. Right before we let you go, just quickly, who do you think is going to be capo cannoniere, uh, Vlaovic or Ciro? Uh, um, well, is Vlaovic Vlaovic going to go to um, Vlahovic going to go to Juventus? Mm. Um, mm. I would go for 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 Chirotto. I think he's going to um, come through for Sari. I don't know. But, um, mm. Yeah, I'd go for, I'd go for Immobile over over Vlahovic because he's. Uh, mm. That's fair. I mean, well, it could happen. He's been amazing so far this yeah. season. He's obviously a gun, and uh, a gun for requisition in the summer. Mm. Or maybe. Yeah. You think, what do you what do you think? You think uh, I, I, Lautaro's I, I, just going to go? No, no, God, I, Lautaro, La, Lautaro's not a goal scorer. He can't score to save his life. It's a second punta, and, and now for I, I had uh, Osiman um, before the injury because I think he's the best number nine <laughs> in the Serie A by a mile. Um, but, what about uh, Leao? I know this is an inter show, but Leao to me, he's on the he's on the he's on the brink of breaking out. Yeah, there's some sort of immaturity there that we saw the other night where he just he's trying too much. It's like he thinks he's playing against his. Yeah. Um, kid, his, his mates from school. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he still, does have with, that little... with the skills that he's got now, and you just like, okay, layout. It's still De Chilio, It's still Rugani. Like they still like played international football. You need to consider your options a little bit better. Well, he he just needs. I mean, as he says himself, Ibrahimovic has taught him more to be, you know, to be more professional and more, you know, more concrete. And I, I think he just needs a little bit of more, more some more of zlatan's uh bulk and fatherhood to, <laughs> to to get him to mature and, and what one more question because i you guys are so uh, you know involved and you know know so much about inter who do you think going into next season and or which area of the field maybe without a name is the area where inter need to invest 
to um, perhaps get to, for example, semi-final. Midfield, midfield, League. midfield, and a striker. I think we all agree. Striker. That. Yeah, striker and midfield. I mean, you have Vecino and Arturo Vidal as your backups, and Roberto Gagliardini. Um, that's just not good enough. And then you also look at the strikers, and you see Jekyll's thirty-five, Alexis Sanchez thirty-three, still good. And then you have Lautaro, and then you have whatever Joaquin Correa is, um, and you, you're, you you see a hole there. I mean, surely, surely that those are the two positions. Um, I think we all agree. But thank you so much for coming on, Owen. This was absolutely brilliant. I know you're not on Twitter and social media anymore. I know you you cut that out a few years. But um, if people want to still want to follow you, do you, do you have any social? Do you have any plans to come back? Um, and 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 if so, where can they find you? Absolutely no plans. You can find me <laughs> on um, on City Our YouTube channel. Obviously, live on the various TV channels that go out. Um, live around the world during the matches and uh, hopefully it will be an entertaining time whether it's Inter or anybody else because it's such a fantastic uh, you know, opportunity to live Serie A and Serie B with um, you know, the international audience so yeah so YouTube would be the one and um, they've opened <laughs> up a Serie B YouTube official channel oh, well, which we're going to really? be doing highlights on as well oh that's awesome so definitely check that out just follow Serie A and you will hear me going on about something <laughs> somewhere <laughs> that sounds great and hopefully I, we can finally meet up again uh, after this pandemic is kind of put to put to bed it's been um, too long. Corsa Como. Corsa Como. That's where we've Corso got to go. Corsa Como. Last... Exactly. That's... Well, well, we, last time we met was Navili. Did we make it to Corsa Como? Yeah, I yeah, we did. we did. We did. We had, did. Um, <laughs> I think we had pizza and beers and then we went down to Navili <laughs> afterwards. That's the, that's the one. Thank you so much for coming on, Owen. It was an absolute pleasure. And, You're uh, welcome. Thank you, for the, thank you for the offer. <laughs> Take care. And bon, bon lavoro for the rest of the season. Say hi to the rest of the guys for me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the the most pressing issue of the day, which is Stefano Sensi. Um, wh- wh- where are we on all this? Because I mean, Jake, you wrote a column saying that it's completely pointless to keep him, and then he did the scored the winner in the Coppa Italia, and then he wasn't used against Venezia when clearly he should have been. Um, I I don't understand what's going on here, and I don't understand why Inter are letting this guy go, um, because clearly. I think we all agree that Stefano Sensi is a better player than Vecino, Gagliardini and Vidal, no? Where, where are we on this? I'll start with you, Mo. I don't know, man. We spoke about Sensi last year uh, a couple of times last season. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, it, it, it's one of those things. If, if the guy's so consistently injured and he's always... He's the kind of player that needs you need to form a midfield around for for you to get the best out of. It's not like he's a he's the sort of player that I mean, you know, the Coppa Italia game aside, but he's not the sort of player that you can just slot in and expect to uh, to to perform for X or Y to get the best out of Sensi. You really need to you know form the midfield around him like Conte did in the first half of his first season. <coughs> Sorry. So in that regard, I don't know if with his fitness injury, if the fitness issues, if they do continue to persist, or if they do persist, uh, whether he's the sort of player that you can really rely on for the future. Uh, like you said, his quality and his uh, skills are are in like not in, in any sort of doubt, but it's whether he can stay fit long enough for you to trust him as a manager as part of a longer project. So. I, I'm not. I'm not part of the intermedical staff, but it definitely is something that needs to be a decision needs to be made on sooner rather than later because you can't have him in limbo for very long. But then again, every time somebody tries to depend on him and play him with a bit of consistency, he injures himself either in training or in the first 15 minutes of being on the pitch. You know, so it's 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 not an easy call. But if he's able to stay fit for sure keep him i mean i don't i don't think anybody in their in their right mind would would say otherwise but it's just a matter of whether you can trust his body to be able to uh to uh have him contribute consistently to the side um what do you think raul where are you on this uh raul yeah um, i mean sorry i was just uh, unplugging there um I mean, yeah, I've spoken about him on my channel, like, 
almost too much lust over the last few days. He's just, yeah, I'm a big Sensi fan, but at the end of the day, Conte pretty much lost faith in him by the end in terms of he just couldn't rely on him, as Mo was saying. Um, Inzaghi lost faith in him pretty sh- straight away after that Sampdoria match when he subbed him in and he had to sub him out after about 10 minutes because he got injured. Um, you know, qualitatively, there's no, you know, discussion. The guy is probably, you know, on his day, he should be the starting left centre mid in this inter team. If we, you know, if we look back at those two months he had at the beginning of the Conte era, but we can't live off that. We can't live off those two months. The guy's basically not been a footballer for almost two seasons now. So, for my in my opinion, he needs to go out and play, and that's what he wants to do. Um, it doesn't benefit Inter, but I think you know we can see whether he's actually able to stay fit. Maybe is it the Inter training methods? I mean, Pintus couldn't seem to work him out and he's supposed to be the best in the business in Zaghi's training staff has seemed to be struggling with him as well so yeah send him to Sampdoria Giampaolo play nice, some nice football there um, not the best situation but at least if he can get some minutes um, I think it'll be better for him What about you Jake? Where are you? I mean you wrote your column before the Coppa Italia and then you went and done that have you changed your mind? Do you think you should offload him or do you think they should keep him? I think it's a really difficult one uh, I think the injury to Correa makes it a little bit harder. Um, I think you've got to look at it in terms of what Inter could bring in in the January transfer window. If you're going to let him go, you're going to need to sign a player to replace Correa then potentially. And I can't see that being a priority. I think if Inter are going to sign anybody, it's perhaps going to be someone on the left flank or maybe even Caicedo as a bit of a vice sort of Jekyll player. Uh, I think in terms of the squad it probably benefits him to keep him around. But I think if you're talking long-term, I'd be inclined to loan him to Sampdoria for the rest of the season with an insistence that whilst he's fit, that he plays the majority of matches, get him a little bit in the shot window. If he plays well and has a good time while he's there, he can come back into the fold maybe. Or if Inter decide in the summer they don't want to use him, they could maybe sell him for a little bit of money because... At the moment, the situation that he's in is he doesn't really play any football. Um, even when there's changes to the selection, he's not even really considered that much. And from a business point of view, it's just not suited into it all to carry a player who they, they're not really going to be able to offload in the current market because nobody's going to want to take him with his fitness record unless it would be a loan deal. So I think... Short term, if they're not willing to buy a player who can link midfield and attack in the window, which I don't think they will, and I don't really blame them either. You know, like you just said, Neem, I think Inter have really got to look at the summer, and that summer transition is getting rid of some of those central midfield players. I mean, I I hope to God Roberto Gallardini's not into next season. That's and that's got that's got to be the focus for the summer. So I think if you're talking the next six months, and that's got to be um, so you're pressing issue I think I'd keep him around because we can't trust Correa to stay fit either so I think I would keep him around but if you're really keen on making the most out of Sensi I, I, I would consider loading him out if you're thinking of getting him in the shot window a little bit or come the summertime you want him to be in good form look I, I agree with everything you guys have said in terms of his fitness but the fact of the matter is that Inter going into a after the international break, playing Milan, Napoli, Roma and Liverpool. And they're going to do that against Liverpool without uh, Barella, who is suspended because of that stupid red card. And Brozovic is on a yellow. There is going to be room for Stefano Sensi if he stays. Um, and quite clearly, he is looking better physically than, he's ever, than he ever has. And I'm looking, and I'm looking at that squad, and I'm thinking, you don't have anyone to replace in, that has Stefano Sensi's special abilities. Matias Vecino, God bless him, no. Arturo Vidal, no. Roberto Gagliardini, let's get real. Are you crazy? So I'm, I'm looking at that midfield, and I'm going, why are you weakening that area of the pitch for no reason whatsoever? Especially when you have a Joaquin Correa who is injured and we don't know how long he'll be injured and once he comes back you know will he won't he will get injured again i mean we don't know that he's in a bad spot right now so to me i don't see any logic at all in sending him out and and as you said well the replacement is to bring in a left wing back 
on loan from from Bundesliga or Premier League and play Ivan Perisic as a second striker. What? No. Ivan Perisic is doing brilliantly where he's playing. Leave him be. Like, I, I don't... I just or, or Caicedo to play as a backup to Dzeko. That's great. For, that makes more sense, even though I don't think Caicedo has any business at this Inter. But uh, for me, it's if clearly when Inter have played the best football, when they've gotten the most out of Hakan Chalanoglu, it is when they've played with Joaquin Correa or some or Stefano Sensi even in that number ten role. So keep Stefano Sensi so you can play him in that number ten role. This is what I just I think it's a, it's a crazy decision, and I and, and and I think the way I look at it, I'm, unless Stefano Sensi has demanded a move, at which point. Okay, fair enough. Then, then that that it is what it is. But I, I don't think he has demanded a move. What he's want, what he wants is to be played. What he wants is for Arturo Vidal, Matias Fasino, and Gagliardini not to be played ahead of him. And to be fair to him and to logic, he they they aren't. They shouldn't be ahead of him. I mean, we can be disappointed with him being injured in the past, but right now he's fit. We saw that he's fit, and we saw that he. Well, yeah, exactly. He's last in the packing order, isn't he? He came on even in the cup. He came on in extra yeah. time, and yesterday he didn't even come on. So that's it's... why, you know. And Inzaghi is a big fan of him. Like you know, he likes. Well, him, he so... clearly isn't. He can't. Well, he says that, but he isn't because he's playing Vecino Gagliardini and, <laughs> and Vidal. Well, that's what I mean. So he must. He could, there's something there that he doesn't. He's lost trust in him, like Conte did. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, I, I just don't think it makes sense, and. If if it's because of the injuries or whatever it is, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I I just find the whole situation bizarre. And I think if you're going into the to the business end of the season when you're playing the Champions League and you're playing your two rivals for the Scudetto and you're weakening yourself, I I, I just don't understand it. I really don't understand it. And and I hope that common sense prevails here, and and everyone calms down, and 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 that Beppe Marotta is able to calm everyone down and keep everyone happy and say, look. We'll ne riparliamo, ne, ne riparliamo in estate. Like we'll we'll discuss this in the summer. Now is just about getting the season home because in the summer, Vecino's going to leave, Alexis is going to leave, Vidal is going to leave. Kolarov is pretty much talking about hanging up his boots right now, and then Inter are probably going to do one or two sign, sell a someone like the De Frey or Skriniar or Lautaro, etc., to, to raise some cash. So th- so there's going to be quite a lot of stuff there's going to be quite a bit of you know room to to, to elaborate on because you, you're offloading these heavy wages so um to me I, I'm, I'm like don't rock the boat you know just just keep everything together until the summer make sure to win that scudetto and if you can the coppa italia that's great then you have the, then you raise the value of these players sending sensi to sampdoria i don't know i, I just don't uh, it makes no sense to me it really doesn't right um let's um Let's briefly uh, talk uh, a little bit about uh, the Venezia game. I, I want to hear what you think, uh, Mo. I mean, Denzel Dumfries, is it safe to say now that he's he's now, he's a success? I mean, the, the, if we look at the, the, that signing, it was a bit of a risk, but it's paid off. No? Yeah, no, for sure. I think, uh, like, uh, like we were saying earlier uh, with Owen, um, he came in a uh, new league, uh, a lot of pressure uh, on his shoulders, and bit by bit, very, uh, very uh, soldier-like, you know, head down, gets to work, does the does the work, uh, week in, week out, and you know, all of a sudden, never, he's, never smiles, you know, never smiles, <laughs> never smiles, yeah, <laughs> Sing, singular expression, uh, regard, regardless of the circumstance. But uh, no, I mean, I, I, what what I like about him is. Is um, is is just how business, uh, how it's all business with him. You know, it's it's uh, it's very uh, what w- what is the meat and potatoes, meat and potatoes sort of thing. Yeah. You know, so uh, yeah, I, I I like him very much. Definitely a successful. Uh, I mean, he he's benching Darmian, and Darmian was the standout player at the first few games of the yeah. season. So uh, yeah, I think I think uh, Dumfries is is really come good. Mm, for sure. Um, uh, well, we we uh, it's gone 56 minutes now, 55 minutes, and I haven't mentioned Kuku Torea yet, Raúl. So, but I'm going to now. Um, are you going to admit that this guy's a flop now? 
<laughs> you, I've said from the beginning this guy's overpriced, but you know me, I always like to back the coach, whether it's Matty Doms, whether it's Ashley Old, yeah, whether Ashley it's Vidal Old. or Kolarov. <laughs> Ashley Old, love it. Inzaghi um, wanted one guy, the poor guy, we took Lukaku from him, we took <laughs> Hakimi from him, we took, well, Ericsson, you know, whatever yeah. happened. So yeah. it's like the poor guy was, was asking for one player, um, very overpriced, but I'm the one of the few remaining peoples on the on the Tuku Korea hype train, and I'll I'll remain on there until <laughs> he leaves this club, which it might be this summer already. But, well, I don't. Yeah, I don't until now he's definitely been a flop. He's, he's been a flop. Yeah, I mean, you're the captain of the Titanic, then, are you? <laughs> you're, you're going <laughs> the down Costa with Concordia. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you're going down with this ship. Well, yeah. I, 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 I definitely give credit for that. That you're, you're loyal to your guy. Um, no, but I mean, honestly, I, 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 it's it's such a shame because, you know, it, 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 he was in a lot of pain, and it's never nice to see footballers cry from pain and agony when they when they suffer on the pitch, and and it re- looked really horrible. Um, what happened to him? And and I mean, hopefully he's back. We'll, we'll see because they haven't, you know, they said something. They're going to re-examine him in two weeks' time, which means that he'll earliest be back in four or five weeks, and then you've got to get him back to fat match fit, fitness as well. Um, so no, it's it's. I mean, thirty three million euros in this economy for that for that guy. It's just, it just it <laughs> burns me. Yeah. You know, it, the, again with the we don't don't do business with the Rome clubs like <laughs> both Inter and Milan. Stop this charity project. Stop the Inter Campus Rome project immediately. Like it's just stop plowing money to these people. They need to delete Lotito's number of the. <laughs> of the no, contacts. no, keep that number. Just make sure that the next signing you make is 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 Sergei Milinkovic Savic. Like th- those are the only players you you bring from them, like that kind of level. You do not bring anyone else because they always screw screw the Milan clubs over, um, and 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 the fact that Lotito is just so obstinate just makes it even more annoying, because um, he, he he thirty three million for Correa, just <laughs> he wanted forty at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> That's even more of an insult. Oh God! And all of this can be blamed to that bastard in in Paris, Leonardo. Because he was going to sign uh, to Korea for whatever money, but as soon as Leo Messi became available, he that that's why that deal never you know went through, and 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 we have to pay for that. So not only did we not get Messi, we we didn't have we didn't get to see Messi being coached by Antonio Conte and Antonio Conte yelling at him to track back and playing him as a wing back. We got screwed out of Conte. And we, we ended up with uh, Korea. Oh, stop crying. <laughs> You're right. Right. Um, let's move on to the part of the show where we uh, pay tribute and rip the piss out of and criticize someone or something heavily in the world of football, starting with the positivity, which we presented by Mr. Positivity himself, Mr. Mohammed Nas. He's, he works a lot, he's intelligent, and he surprises uh, people sometimes with his uh, ideas. Not easy to find one person of this uh, quality. Yo, so uh, the first uh, Marathi of uh, 2022 has got to be, I think, the man who's been the subject of uh, this uh, podcast, more or less, uh, Simone Inzaghi. It was a very difficult January. There's still a very difficult February uh, ahead of him. But, uh, you know, we were all a bit weary uh, come the winter break, how the team is going to restart uh, the new year. It's always been a bit tricky. But um, I think um, the way he has handled uh, the, 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 the tough games, the two extra times, um, uh, two matches with, with uh, full ex- practically full extra times, uh, has been A, if not A+. Plus. Um, so, yeah, uh, Inzaghi's got to be my, um, my um, first Murati of the year and hopefully to many, many more. That's awesome. Well done. And also, please, you know, get well soon. Simone, you know, he's tested positive for COVID and, you know, he's he's in isolation. Hopefully he recovers as soon as possible. Um, right. Let's move on to something much more comical. This week's Frog, which we presented by Mr. Jake Smalley. E clamoroso! Autogol di Ranocchia! OK, if you've got any spare time, this evening, please have a look on YouTube at Clevenden Town in uh, non-league English football, and you'll without a doubt see probably the greatest goal that I've ever seen. And there's a bit of a campaign uh, going to get it nominated for the Puskas Award, 
uh, further this year. So Clevenden Town, that is. Have a look. It's a 40-yard volley. It's the most bizarre and most absurd goal I've ever seen. A big clearance away. And the fullback decides he's on the touchline and he decides he's going to hit it first time. And it lobs everybody and he couldn't have hit it any more pure right into the top corner of the net. So in terms of what was I thought was quite a damp weekend in terms of football, uh, it was quite a fun moment for me. Yeah, it was. And my, my favourite part of that clip is the guy who says... Is the, is the guy that says hello? <laughs> you can hear someone as soon as he hits the ball. You hear someone <laughs> going, "Oh, hello." <laughs> that's British humour for like, you, absolutely yeah. British humour. It's fun. <laughs> and, and, and then it's, you just, it's just, it's really, really funny. Um, right, let's move on to uh, something much more negative. This week's uh, Modji, which we presented by Mr. Raul Shah. Well, Modji of the Week, uh, we actually talked about it already um, at the beginning of the pod, um, and it was the the pitch, the San Siro turf, um, you know, as has been reported by many outlets, a lot of the players have been complaining, the coaches have been complaining, apart from uh, Florenzi, who's the only one who was uh, <laughs> <laughs> who said, you know, real champions can play on any type oh, of pitch. shut up. <laughs> he should talk. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah, well, it's already been uh, properly addressed because it's such in such a bad state. It's embarrassing that the you know the one of the best stadiums in the world has to have a pitch like that that looks so patchy and has so many bubbles. So yeah, Maldini confirmed that over this break it will be re-turfed. So hopefully it should be looking good and brand new and shiny for the just in time for the Milan derby. But until for the last few months, it's been a pain in the backside for for Inter because you know we play some nice football on the floor and you just see the ball just bouncing around all over the place and so when they take a shot it just uh they always look back at the patch um you know swearing us a lot of the times they probably just blame it just for the sake of it but I think in this case it's actually true the pitch is really bad yeah and I mean in all honesty I think Ibrahimovic's injury and to a certain extent Joaquin Correa's injury was could have partly been down to that I'll take that because, <laughs> no, no, but seriously, like I, I think you can say that because it's it's such a the, the surface is so hard and and these guys are, you know, the, the way that, you know, they it affects. I mean, we, we know, for example, that it's not just by chance that Roma had all these ACLs. Um, so so I, I absolutely think that this is definitely part of it. it, it, it that's why he doesn't play Sensi. <laughs> he's afraid he's going to break. <laughs> That's brilliant. Uh, he's afraid our Ming vase is going to break. But no, and dishonorable mention in terms of Moji on social media this past weekend, certain Juve and Milan fans trying to turn Edin Dzeko elbow before the equalizer into some sort of Calciopoli scandal oh, is just like, guys, I'm sorry that you don't live in reality, but this is ridiculous. And some people saying that it's a straight red card. No, no, it's not. It's not if you know the rules, because there's no violent conduct there. He, it's I, I, I can, I'm, I'm willing to say that it should, it should have been a free kick before. I absolutely think so because he, and you know, all players are responsible for their elbows, and if you elbow someone in the face, even though you, there's no intention, I think there's a good case to be made that it's a foul. I mean, you, you elbowed someone in the face, but the VAR can't intervene because. Venezia were in control of the ball afterwards and that makes it a new situation as per the rules and to say that this was a red card no it's not even a yellow card and I've been in contact with so many referees over you know just asking to verify this and one of them was like why are you asking stupid questions you know better than this and that's a direct quote from a referee so you know when I was like yeah sorry I was just making sure but because it's ridiculous it's stop it stop trying to create scandals (laughs) <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's just ridiculous. Do you know what I honestly think this is? I, I, this reminded me of something that was going around a few months ago, um, of that clip of Lautaro pulling, was it Freud? Oh, the in the box yeah. yeah, so... That's the, the only thing that, they've got. No, Inter this have gotten away with... Yeah, yeah, sorry. This, this is exactly what it is, it, because there's so much 
that can be beaten at New Bay Store, for example. It's their own sad, weird little way of saying, "Well, you get it too." You know, it's 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 ridiculous, and <laughs> I, I, it's, it, it's, it's oh no, it it, bl- it blows my mind. It's, it's making them feel better. It's like yeah, we can complain about something. See, the referee's not always on our side. Oh, it really no, but, it's so frustrating. <laughs> but it's true. The coping mechanisms of the last two weeks has been incredibly entertaining by certain Juve fans on social media after losing the the Supercoppa uh, and, and Milan. Fans as well certain milan fans it's like guys you really need to learn to cope like it's just <laughs> it's it's getting pathetic now um and, and it's funny i mean it's it, it's so hilarious because if this is all they've got to come with to prove the giant scandals i'm like okay <laughs> bring it on because it's just hilarious uh, i turn into cartman and be like let, let me lick your tears because they're delicious um <laughs> uh, anyway <laughs> right Let's all oh, get time for this week. I'd like to thank Owen Nielsen and I'd like to thank Mo who had to rush off. I'd like to thank you, Raul, for coming on once again. Uh, thank you for having me on as usual. Very much a pleasure as always. And also, Mig- boy, too cool. yeah, and also <laughs> ripping your ripping, ripping your career sexualism. And if people want to check you out, it's uh, at uh, what is it at on uh, on Twitter and what is it on YouTube? At R Sharms with two Zs um, on Twitter and yeah, Uncle Sharma on YouTube. Hopefully, you find me and not the cricketers and musicians. <laughs> oh dear. Um, yeah, Uncle Sharma can definitely, definitely, definitely uh, recommend a follow on all social media there. And uh, Mr. Jake Smalley, thank you for coming on. No, thank you as always. And I'm actually starting to feel a little bit more uh, content with Korea now. Uh, I, re- I really <laughs> like the idea of. Uh, of that signing and I knew what would happen and it is happening but you know there's Shama's that little voice in my mind now that sort of telling me going it can be good it can be he's the voice he's that little voice in your mind that you should be suppressing it's the angel (laughs) and the devil on its shoulder isn't it It literally yeah and he's the devil (laughs) (laughs) no he's the devil Oh, God. Right. I'd Thank you all for listening. We'll be back uh, on a weekly basis. We record on Mondays now, and we've got quite a few exciting games coming up. We've got uh, the Derby, and then we've got Roma in the Coppa Italia, and then we've got uh, Napoli, and then, if I'm not mistaken, we've got Liverpool. So there's quite a lot of th- good things coming up uh, soon, and we'll be doing some cool things ahead of that as well. But until next time, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Have a lovely weekend, and I hope all your respective national teams win their games. My Iran is playing on Thursday, 3.30 p.m. CET against Iraq at home. In And if they win that, they are through to the World Cup. Um, hope all your teams wins, and uh, sempre e solo forza Inter.